all of that stimulation that's keeping them actually engaged in the screen. So we've had for a while what we call the overstimulation hypothesis, which is that prolonged exposure to this rapid image change during this critical window of brain development would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input, and that would lead to inattention in later life. So you watch enough Baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and when you go to a farm as a school-aged child, it's boring. It's too slow. How come there's no sheep suddenly popping into my face? How come there's no marionette going back and forth? Why do I have to walk from here to there? That's the general idea, that you're conditioning the mind to that reality, which doesn't actually exist. And we, we tested this uh, some years ago, and what we found was that the more television children watch before age three, the more likely they were to actually have attentional problems at school age. Specifically, for each hour that they watched before the age of three, their chances of having attentional problems was increased by about 10%. So a child who watched two hours of TV a day before the age of three would be 20% more likely to have attention problems compared to a child who watched none. Now, what else did we find? We found that the more cognitive stimulation children uh, received, and we measured cognitive stimulation in terms of how often parents read to their child, how often they took them to the museum, how often they sang to them, we found that cognitive stimulation reduced the chances of attentional problems later in life. In fact, each hour of cognitive stimulation reduced them by about 30%. So if you will, these are two sides of the same coin. There are certain things that we can do early on in our children's lives that enhance their ability to pay attention, and certain things that we can do early on that actually impede them. Now, if our hypothesis was right, that it's based on the, the pacing of the programs, and you might imagine that what children watch actually is important. And so, content would be key. And I'll give you two examples of content to illustrate that point. The first is the Powerpuff Girls movie the right mix of sugar and spice for a satisfying rush. I don't know how many of you have seen that, but here's a scene from that. Okay, so that was, again, you can see a lot of rapid sequencing. In fact, this was the first movie that was ever rated PG for non-stop frenetic animated action. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making it up, that's the back of the box there. Now, I want to contrast that with something that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Uh, it really needs no introduction, but this is a clip from Mr. Rogers for you to watch. Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. I brought my television neighbor to see what a restaurant was like. Oh, I'm so glad. Can I show you a table? Certainly. I'm awfully busy today. One of the waitresses is ill. I see. So I'm sort of doing double duty. How about this? This is fine. Thank Grand. you very much. Sit down and I'll be right back. All right. Now, when you come to a restaurant, usually somebody shows you what table you're supposed to sit at. And uh, one of the first things you do is to put your napkin either on your lap or up here. And then, well, this is the way a table is set. So... <laughs> Fred, Fred Rogers invented reality TV. He's, <laughs> he's not credited with it. Actually, it's, it's not reality, right? It's even slower paced than reality. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the waitress says, I'm awfully busy, but she doesn't seem the least bit hurried. <laughs> so you can see that there are very, very real differences in pacing. And when we followed up our study with a subsequent experiment to look at what children actually watch, what you see is that educational programs like Mr. Rogers pose no increased risk of attentional problems. Entertainment programs like the Powerpuff Girls movie increase the chances by about 60%, and violent programming, which I didn't show you, increases it even by, by more than 100%, and violent programs are typically even more rapidly sequenced. Now, in the last uh, year, we've been building actually a mouse model of television viewing in my lab, and you are now watching Mouse TV here. 
uh, the sounds are from the cartoon network, and the lights are uh, basically photorhythmically generated by those sounds. This is what it looks like. There's, these are the TV lounges here that the mice live in. Uh, and they have speakers above and lights around them. And what we do is we start about 10 days of life, and these mice watch TV six hours a day for 42 days. It's basically their entire childhood spent in front of a television, which is not uncommon these days for some children even. And then 10 days later, we actually assess their behavior in a few ways I want to show with you. The first test we do measures their activity and risk-taking. Now, we do what's called the open field test. Now, mice have two kind of competing instincts. You'll see them here. One is to avoid being in the middle of anything, because, of course, mice have very few friends, and being in the middle of this open field is risky. But, of course, they have a competing interest uh, instinct to forage for food, so at some point, they do need to go into the middle and explore their environment. Now, we put these mice in here and test them, and we exploit the fact that it's a white mouse on a black background, and with a computer above, we can actually track their movement. And you can see on the left is sort of a normal mouse spending most of its time around the perimeter. But look at the one on the right. Notice how much time it spends in the middle, but also notice just how much general activity this mouse is actually exhibiting. So this is both a hyperactive and a risk-taking mouse. And when we look at our, our overstimulated compared to our control mice, we find that the overstimulated mice spend more time in the center, and they enter the center more than the regular mice do. The next test we do is what's called the novel object recognition, and this tests short-term memory and learning. We put a mouse in a, in a box with two objects, and the mouse will explore both of them, get to know them, if you will. And then we take the mouse out, and an hour later, we replace one object with a novel object. And we see how much time the mouse spends on each object. Now, the mouse that is learning, that has good short-term memory, will spend more time on the novel object, and you can see that here as opposed to the one on the right, which is spending the same amount of time with both objects. And what did we find? Well, we found that our control mice, our normal mice, spent 75% of their time with a novel object. But look at what our TV viewing, our overstimulated mice, did. They spent the exact same amount of time. It was as if they couldn't distinguish the two objects or they didn't care, but one way or another, they were not learning. They were not acting like normal mice. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a study we did with, with children. It's a building block study. It was a randomized trial here in a low-income clinic in Seattle. We took 200 children who were 18 to 24 months of age, and we gave half of them blocks at the beginning of the study and half of them blocks at the end. And their parents got what we call blocktivities monthly. These were ways to play with your children with blocks. Sort the blocks, stack the blocks, count the blocks. Really simple things that come naturally to a lot of parents, but what a lot of low-income parents don't do with their children regularly. And here's what, we, here's what happened. The children who got the blocks, 59% of them played with them on a typical day, as opposed to 13% who didn't get the blocks initially. They played for about 20 minutes a day, about one and a half episodes a day, and about 65% of the time was with their parent. And then six months later, we assessed their language. And see on the right here that the kids who got the blocks late scored in the 42nd percentile, which is below average, but unfortunately not uncommon in low-income populations uh, it, in Seattle and, for that matter, around the world. And the kids who got the blocks, they actually scored a 56th percentile significantly better and slightly above average. So promoting that kind of interactive play actually promoted language development in these young children. So I want to conclude by impressing on you that early childhood is very important for children and, and for mice, uh, and it's critical to their development. And we need more real-time play today and less fast-paced media, particularly for young children. It's vitally important that we have that, because if we change the beginning of the story, we change the whole story. A worker is someone who is trapped within repetition, a slave of the system set up before him. But now I have successfully shown that I was the best slave. I did what I was told to the extreme. While others sat in class and doodled to later become great artists, I sat in class to take notes to become a great test taker. While others would come to class without their homework done because they were reading about an interest of theirs, I never missed an assignment. While others were creating music and writing lyrics, I decided to do extra credit, even, I, even though I didn't even need it. So I wonder, why did I even want this position? Sure, I earned it, but what will come of it? 
When I leave educational institutionalism, will I be successful or forever lost? I have no clue about what I want to do with my life. I have no interest because I saw every subject as a study, as work, and I excelled at every subject just for the purpose of excelling and not learning. And quite frankly, I'm very scared. John Teller Gatto, a retired school teacher and activist critical of compulsory schooling, asserts, we could encourage the best qualities of youthfulness, curiosity, adventure, resilience, the capacity for surprising insight simply by being more flexible about time, texts, and tests, by introducing kids into tr truly competent adults, and by giving each student what autonomy he or she needs in order to take a risk every now and then. But we don't do that. Between these cinder block walls, we are all expected to be the same. We are trained to ace every standardized test, and those who deviate and see light through a different lens are worthless to the scheme of public education, and therefore viewed with contempt. H.L. Mencken wrote in the American Mercury for April 1924 that the aim of public education is not to fill the young of this species with knowledge and awaken their intelligence, Nothing could be further from the truth. The aim is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. That is the aim in the United States. To illustrate this idea, doesn't it perturb you to learn about the idea of critical thinking? Is there really such a thing as uncritically thinking? To think is to process information in order to form an opinion. But if we are not critical when processing this information, are we really thinking? Or are we mindlessly accepting other opinions as truth? This was happening to me, and if it wasn't for the rare occurrence of an avant-garde 10th grade English teacher, Donna Bryan, I would have been doomed. I am now enlightened, but my mind still feels disabled. I must retrain myself and constantly remember how insane this ostensibly sane place really is. And now here I am in a world guided by fear, a world suppressing the uniqueness that lies inside each of us, a world where we can either acquiesce to the inhuman nonsense of corporatism and materialism or insist on change. We are not enlivened by an educational in system that clandestinely sets us up for jobs that could be automated, for work that need not be done, for enslavement, enslavement without fervency for meaningful achievement. We have no choices in life when money is our motivational force. Our motivational force ought to be passion, but this is lost from the moment we step into a system that trains us rather than inspires us. We are more than robotic bookshelves conditioned to blurt out facts we were taught in school. We are all very special. Every human on this planet is very special. So aren't we all deserving of something better? of using our minds for innovation rather than memorization, for creativity rather than futile activity, for rumination rather than stagnation. We are not here to get a degree to then get a job so we can consume industry approved application after application. There is more and more still. The saddest part is that the majority of students don't have the opportunity to reflect as I did. The majority of students are put through the same brainwashing techniques in order to create a complacent labor force working in the interests of large corporations and secretive government. And worst of all, they are completely unaware of it. I will never be able to turn back these 18 years. I can't run away to another country with a different education system, perhaps meant to enlighten rather than Christian. This part of my life is over, and I want to make sure that no other child will have his or her potential suppressed by powers meant to exploit and control. We are human beings. We are thinkers, dreamers, explorers, artists, writers, engineers. We are anything we want to be, but only if we have an educational system that supports us rather than holds us down. A tree can grow, but only if its roots are given a healthy foundation. For those of you out there that must continue to sit in desks and yield to the author authoritarian ideologies of instructors, do not be disheartened. You still have the opportunity to stand up, ask questions, be critical, and create your own perspective. Demand a setting that will provide you with intellectual capabilities that allow you to expand your mind instead of directing it. Demand that you be interested in class. Demand that the excuse, you have to learn this for the test, is not good enough for you. 
Education is an excellent tool. It's used properly. But focus more on learning rather than getting good grades.